You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Jillian Cantor back on the show with me today. She was on the show a couple of years ago when she had, uh, when her brand new book at the time was In Another Time, uh, and what a phenomenal book that was. You can go back and listen to that episode. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Um, But today, she's here to talk about a new book that she has, which is um, a fascinating book. It is a a feminist retelling of the Great Gatsby, and um, you know, a really unique perspective. And uh, that book is called Beautiful Little Fools, and uh, I'm excited to talk about it today. Welcome back to the show, Jillian. Thank you. Thanks for having me again. I'm so excited to have you. Um, so, Jillian, when we talked, uh, it was 2019, I believe it was, uh, around the springtime, and you know, we. We all had these great hopes and dreams of what, you know, the next couple of years were going to bring. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, um, you know, as that year wound down, um, you know, some stuff happened. So yeah. um, y- you have uh, published three books in the interim, I, I believe, uh, with the new one, Beautiful Little Fools. Is that right? Yeah. Beautiful Little Fools will be my third. since. Yeah. Then. So what? first off, what's it like writing and maintaining a publication schedule in the middle of a pandemic? Well, Beautiful Little Fools was the first book I actually wrote during the pandemic. Um, okay. like you, I had a, another book out um, in March of 2021, and I had a book out in the fall of 2020, but both of those were finished before the, the pandemic. Um, so Beautiful Little Fools was the first one that I wrote actually during the pandemic time. Um, and I actually had started it January, 2020. Um, I sold it just on the first 50 pages and an outline in February, 2020. So I had no idea even when I sold the book that I was going to be writing it during a pandemic. But when I really wrote the book was like March, April, May and June of 2020. Um, so it was it was definitely a different experience and not what I expected going into it. Um, you know, as a writer, I work at home always. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm always home, but usually I'm home by myself. And then suddenly I was home with my kids and then, you know, my husband was on zoom and we were all in the house all the time. And so I didn't get that normal quiet space that I usually have to write. Um, but at the same time, I didn't have anywhere I had to go in those months, which is very rare. You know, we we're always, busy and I have two kids and I'm always driving. And so I had this like long, these long stretches of uninterrupted time where I didn't have to be anywhere. So I found myself writing at different hours or, you know, writing late at night. Um, so it was, it was just a really interesting and different experience. You know, writers, um, uh, most everyone is in the same situation that you are. Um, we usually have a home office or something that we're yeah. working from. And, you know, the majority of the uh, the hours of work that a writer does are, are spent in solitude and, you know, without mm-hmm. uh, anyone else around. And uh, one thing that, I, that I've heard from a lot of people is that, you know, they're they're now dealing with the presence of other people and and that kind of. Um, you know, changes the dynamic of your creative process. But also, um, you know, I've heard from some other people that, you know, even though um, writers tend to work uh, alone and in solitude, in solitude, that the knowing that the rest of the world is doing the same as well, um, you know, has a a certain um, mental, uh, it, 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 it has a way of, kind of influencing the way we feel about the world that there's something uh, about just knowing that the rest of the world is getting up and going to work and Mm -hmm. and all of it, even though, you know, I'm here at my home office. Um, (laughs) you know, was there some of that sort of, um, 
you know, did, did that factor into, you know, the way that you do things or the way that you think about stories or that, you know, did, did that affect you at all? Just kind of knowing the rest of the world was was locked down with you? Well, I mean, it you know, it definitely like hit pretty close to home for me because my kids were doing sure. school from their bedrooms, which were just across the hall from my office. So and, you know, and they would walk in during passing periods and talk to me or, you know, I would get to have lunch with them, which was you know, nice, actually. Um, but it just so I, I was very aware that that was going on. But I think in terms of the book, I mean, um, Beautiful Little Fools takes place in like from 1917 to 1923. And, you know, the summer when the Great Gatsby took place, the summer of 1922, it's just past the 1918-19 pandemic. It's just past World War One, And I think I had this sort of new appreciation for the revelry that happens in the book and, and the Roaring Twenties in general and why, you know, there was that feeling of like celebration. And I don't think I ever personally got that before, you know, living through my own pandemic. That, you know, that is a great perspective because I've not heard many people talk about that, that um, the knowing that other people have been through similar circumstances mm -hmm. and, and you know, not only did they survive, but, you know, um, society as a whole thrived after that. And um, mm -hmm. that, that that is a, a unique perspective to keep in mind for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, so I definitely thought about that as I was writing and, um, you know, I did, I found a, sm a small way to get that in the book. <laughs> that's That's great. Um, when we chatted last in another time uh, was your new release and it was a um, a historical fiction novel um, mm -hmm. and uh, it may be what we think of as, as a traditional historic 20th century historical fiction novel. Um, since then, you've wrote um, The Code for Love and Heartbreak, which is a retelling of Jane Austen's Emma. Uh, and then uh, Half-Life, uh, you published after that, and it's a um, a, a look at Marie Curie's um, life and mm -hmm. you know, and kind of an alternate timeline. And and now we've got a retelling of uh, of the Great Gatsby. What is it about these historical times and stories that fascinate you so much? You know, I think I'm always drawn to stories of strong women in, in all of my books. And even though it's it's like across time periods and genres, like that's sort of my what draws me in um, and the code for love and heartbreak is actually a young adult retelling of Emma. So it's set in a modern day high school, but my Emma um, is the president of her coding club and she makes an app to match make her um, fellow students with disastrous results. So, you know, mm -hmm. even that, which seems so much different from half life, which is a novel about Marie Curie, it's sort of just like focusing on uh strong women making their way in the world and and beautiful little fools too. It's a reimagining of the world of the great Gatsby, but from the women's perspective and the women are in control of the narrative and are telling the story this time around. When you, when you have a, a story or a time period that um, is really resonating with you, what, what's the decision process like for, you know, choosing a, a, something to retell or, or, or something to look at from a different, character's perspective or you know what how, how do you settle on on something that you want to tackle um you know it has to be something that i'm just really really interested in spending a year or two of my life with and usually it's something that i can't stop thinking about or i can't let go of you know i have i have a lot of thoughts where i think oh i could write a book about this and then i forget about most of them <laughs> or i write them down and you know I, I let them sit but it's the ones that keep coming back that i keep thinking about over and over that i can't let go of and it's almost like the idea chooses me in that way because i start to obsess over it <laughs> things we never got over the new book by best-selling author Lucy Score, Bearded Bad Boy Barber Knox, refers to live his life the way he takes his coffee, alone, unless you count his basset hound Waylon. Knox doesn't tolerate drama even when it comes in the form of a stranded runaway bride. Naomi wasn't just running away from her wedding. She was riding to the rescue of her estranged twin to knock him out Virginia, a rough around the edges town where disputes are settled the old-fashioned way with fist and beer, usually in that order. Too bad for Naomi, her evil twin hasn't changed at all. After helping herself to Naomi's car and cash, 
Tina leaves her with something unexpected. The niece Naomi didn't know she had. Now she's stuck in town with no car, no job, no plan, and no home with an 11-year-old going on 30 to take care of. There's a reason Knox doesn't do complications or high-maintenance women, especially not the romantic ones. But since Naomi's life imploded right in front of him, the least he can do is help her out of her jam. And just as soon as she stops getting into new trouble, he can leave her alone and get back to his peaceful, solitary life. At least that's the plan until the trouble turns to real danger. Things We Never Got Over, the new book by best-selling author Lucy Score. Dabble is a proud sponsor of Author Stories. Dabble is an easy-to-use cloud-based writing tool that gives writers a way to organize, plot, and create amazing stories wherever they are. Write in our desktop app, on your Mac or Windows computer, tablet, or mobile device. Dabble syncs your latest version with the cloud on all your devices. Write anywhere and anytime inspiration strikes. We got you. Dabble is my preferred writing tool, and I think it will be yours as well. Visit DabbleWriter.com for your free trial. An Innocent Client, the first book in the Joe Dillard legal thriller series. A preacher is found brutally murdered in a Tennessee motel room. A beautiful, mysterious young girl is accused. In this best-selling debut, criminal defense lawyer Joe Dillard has become jaded over the years as he's tried to balance his career against his conscience. Savvy but cynical, Dillard wants to quit doing criminal defense, but he can't resist the chance to represent someone who might actually be innocent. His drug-addicted sister has just been released from prison and his mother is succumbing to Alzheimer's. But Dillard's commitment to the case never wavers despite the personal troubles and professional demands that threaten to destroy him. Chosen by BookBub readers as one of the top 100 crime novels of all time, get started on this great series with an innocent client where it all started. Read for free with Kindle Unlimited or buy it in paperback or audiobook. An Innocent Client by Scott Pratt. Um, how do you, how, how do you tackle like like when when you start thinking about take Beautiful Little Fools for instance, mm-hmm. um, a story that we're all very familiar with, one of the greatest novels of the 20th yeah. century. Um, how do you start? You know, when you say, well, I I want to take this story, but I want to I want to look at it from the female perspective and and you know get the the bird's eye view from or, or the character's view from from these different angles and and, and different characters and, and how they see the same instances um, that that we're familiar with. How, how do you start looking at uh, or I guess a, a better question would be um, how how true to the source material do you try to be or uh, is that something that um, you know, are you worried about being? true to the source material or is this are, are you looking for more of an inspiration type of thing and then um just kind of let the story be it's a new thing like um you know are you trying to to you know be um be true to the great gatsby mm-hmm. or is this just an influence you know, it's actually pretty true to The Great Gatsby, um, and I have to say that I've always been a huge fan of The Great Gatsby, and it's it's a book that I've reread over the years again and again. I just come back to it because I love it, and, you know, something that's always intrigued me about it is that F. Scott Fitzgerald chose Nick as the point of view character, and Nick is the outsider in this world, so right. everything we're seeing in The Great Gatsby is filtered through Nick. In Beautiful Little Fools, you know, the entire timeline that I, that I set up from 1917 through 1923 is drawn from the original Great Gatsby. Um, and there's there's like a page or two, I think, in the book where Jordan talks about what she and Daisy did in this five-year period. And so that ends up being two-thirds of my book, you know, what's going on in 1917 <laughs> through 1921. Um And so in terms of like where all the characters were and what events are happening in their lives, you know, that's all from the original Great Gatsby. But in terms of staying true to the source, I felt that the Great Gatsby is narrated by Nick. So everything we're getting is from Nick's perspective, Nick's gaze. And Daisy and Jordan are really big parts of the plot in the original, but we barely hear them speak. 
And so I felt I had a lot of leeway once I put things in their point of view. And even if I was creating the same scene that Nick showed us, if we were seeing it through Daisy's eyes, it could be entirely different. It would be entirely different. Um, so I feel like I stayed true to what happened in The Great Gatsby, but I made Daisy and Jordan and Myrtle and Catherine very much my own. Uh, and I felt there was a lot of room to play around with, you know, their points of view and how they see the world. Jillian, are you uh, are, are you a, a great planner um, or are you more of a pantser in your writing process? You know, I'm usually a pantser and in this book I planned. <laughs> so I um, I felt I had to for this book because I did want to stay true to The Great Gatsby. Right. So I sort of plotted out, you know, where everybody was in time based on what was in the original and then what everyone was doing based on the original. So I did actually start with a really detailed outline of where this book was going to go. And that's not normally how how I write. Um, but I actually found the outline was very hard and the writing was much easier. You know, that said, I'm working on um, another book now and I didn't outline anything. So I, I guess I went <laughs> back to my original ways. <laughs> I love it. So did you did you take the Great Gatsby and deconstruct it um, mm -hmm. before then planning this one so that you, you know, did understand, you know, all of the twists and turns and the different uh, character perspectives? Did you have to kind of yeah. break all that apart to then see what you're dealing with to to then, you know, give us this other perspective? Yes, I did. I did for sure. You know, I re I actually reread The Great Gatsby three times when I was working on this book, once before starting and doing the outline. And I sort of took extensive notes on, you know, where every character was in each year. Um, there's a few lines and a few scenes in The Great Gatsby that repeat in my book, but from a different point of view and sort of take on a different meaning. So I sketched all that out. I reread it again after I wrote the first draft for some details and some lines that I missed. And then I read it a third time when I was doing the copy edit stage. So I did spend a lot of time uh, deconstructing it and, and thinking about um, every line. And there's one line that just sort of sticks out to me in The Great Gatsby, and it's it's in that scene near the end when they're all at the plaza and they're drinking and it's very hot. And Jordan has one line where she talks about um, something that happens after Daisy's wedding right before her father died. And that becomes like a major plot point in her storyline for me. I, I have this vision in my mind of, of uh, a detective that, you know, stalking a serial killer and you've got stuff, you know, all up on your walls and strings connecting everything. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, that's my walls actually didn't have anything, but I had just like a lot of like notes all over my desk and, you know, a big document with everything in it. But yeah. <laughs> so funny. Um, you know, we talked about how The Great Gatsby was, you know, one of the greatest novels of the 20th century and, and mm -hmm. is so beloved by so many people, um, even though the world of The Great Gatsby here in 2021 is is really a, a foreign thing. Um, uh, you know, life has changed so much. Society mm -hmm. has changed so much. W what is it about that novel, uh, that original novel, that is so endearing and enduring um, that that is something that we keep going back to and, and still resonates, you know, almost 100 years later? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think first I want to say that when the novel first came out, it was um, a critical and commercial failure. It barely sold any copies. Yes. Even when F. Scott Fitzgerald died in the 1940s, he thought the novel was a failure when he died. And it wasn't until after that that it took off. And, you know, now we know it as, as this enduring classic, but that that wasn't how it was when it first came out, which I always find super, super interesting um, but I mean, what always drew me to it was, you know, the writing is is beautiful. Um, it has this really unique perspective, this outsider perspective. And it's also just like filled with so much interesting stuff about the Roaring Twenties. There's affairs and murder and parties and recklessness. And it's just this like, feels like this really well described piece at this very specific moment in time. Uh, and I, I feel like that's what has always drawn me to it as a reader. When when you're um, when you're working on a book like this, you know, there's uh, there's a point in in the writing where it's just you and mm -hmm. it, it's just you and the story and and, you know, 
anything is possible. There, there are no limits. There are no fears of um, uh, of how people are going to receive it. Um, uh, you know, it's it's just you and the story, and and that is such a freeing place to mm. be. But at some point, um, you know, the the other concerns of life and the business and all of that come in, and you start, you know, then you realize that you that the audience for this is going to be be bigger than just you. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, at what point in the process did did those types of concerns uh, start coming in, and and or, or was it something you were thinking about from the very beginning? You know, I wasn't thinking about it when I was writing. I just I enjoyed writing this book so much. I mean, I think just being a, a fan of The Great Gatsby and always wanting to know more about what the women were thinking. This was just like a really fun, enjoyable writing exercise, writing process for me. So I didn't think about that at all as I was writing. Um, I would say like after the book had been edited, you know, I revised, it went through copy edits. And I think maybe when Galley started to be printed, I thought, oh, people are going to read this. (laughs) So I don't think it influenced me during the writing process, but of course it always comes into my head afterwards, you know, and it's, um, so far the reception has been really great which I'm I'm really excited about but um it it does always creep into my head when I get to the the point where I know that I'm gonna have to talk about the book and people are gonna read the book but I didn't think about it when I was writing one thing that that uh intrigued me um and and always does when when you're talking about historical fiction is especially historical fiction with with strong female voices um, is, is there ever a concern about balancing um, the way life was with the way life is now? Um, you know that there are things that happened in the tw- in the 1920s mm. that would never happen in the 2020s. You know, hopefully we have moved um, mm-hmm. societally, you know, far past you know some of the you know the mistakes and shortcomings of of our past. Um, but how do you balance out being true to the way things were while also wanting to, um, you know, say that, you know, there there is something else to say about these situations? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think even even in historical fiction or especially in historical fiction, there's just some themes that are universal that are true today and were true then. And, you know, it's things like the the sort of like struggle to survive and thrive and falling in love and, you know, falling out of love and all, and all of that stuff is sort of a universal human experience. And I think the historical element is in the details of, of the time period and the restrictions for women at the time and sort of the societal norms at the time. Um, But I feel like, you know, even though Daisy and Jordan and Catherine and Myrtle are living in this very different time and women are seen differently, it's it's like they're still experiencing the same, you know, human emotions that we're experiencing today. Sure. Um, how did you handle the the murder mystery um aspect of the book? Um, you know, you know, when when there when something happens um that has already happened, um mm. How, how do you handle, um, you know, giving different perspectives to that and, and um, you know, knowing, I, I guess, knowing some of the mysteries of the book that that have been solved um, because, you know, most of us have read The Great Gatsby. Yeah. Um, you know, how do you handle that and, and keeping the intrigue up, even though people know, you know, kind of how the story is going to end? So my novel actually is very much sort of a murder mystery. Um, There is a detective character who threads in between the women's chapters. And, you know, in the original novel, um, Myrtle is hit by Jay Gatsby's car and she dies. And then Jay Gatsby shot and Myrtle's husband is, you know, also found shot nearby. And they just declare the case a murder-suicide and it's over. Um, so we all know that from the original Gatsby. My novel begins where there's a detective who finds a diamond hairpin by the scene of Gatsby's murder, and he starts to suspect that one of the women in Gatsby's orbit might have been involved and that it might not have been a murder-suicide. So there's an entirely different uh, mystery in my version, which sort of fits within the confines of the original. Um, so, ho- you know, hope. Hopefully <laughs> it did keep the intrigue up to do that. 
Love it. Love it. Um, Jillian, we talked about how different um, the writing has been during the pandemic and, and how, mm-hmm. how family um, you know, structures have changed and daily routines have changed. Um, what about the publishing end of it? What, what's it been like launching books, um, you know, while, while the, the world has yeah. been kind of off kilter? Uh, you know, it's, I mean, it's definitely been different without doing anything in person, um, which has been both, I think, good and bad. You know, I'm, I miss like the interaction with actual readers and, and bookstores, but I've, I've done a lot of virtual events and I've gotten to do them with authors that I'm friends with that live all over that I wouldn't normally get to do events with. So I feel like that's been really positive. Um, but I, you know, when Half Life came out, it was in the part of the pandemic where no one was really vaccinated yet. So like, I, I didn't even see it in a bookstore for like two months after it came out. <laughs> so it was this weird thing that I knew was out in the world, but I didn't really see its existence. So I wasn't really sure I believed it. And so that was definitely <laughs> different. Um, but it, you know, and just even in terms of launching beautiful little fools it was like we were trying to plan a book tour and at first we were going to do an in-person book tour and then now we're doing an all virtual book tour and it's just very hard to predict in advance what the world was going to be like and if people were going to be going to events when the book came out and so that element is definitely different um but a lot of you know even publishing is kind of solitary for me because I'm I'm still at home still still like promoting <laughs> stuff from home and that didn't really change because of the pandemic I would just say the traveling and the in-person events is, is obviously much different have you noticed a difference in um you know if uh if people are buying more kindle editions or audiobooks um you know as opposed to the hardcovers mm-hmm. or paperbacks um has has have you noticed any change there Um, you know, I don't, I don't think I would know the answer to that. I mean, I'm sure my publisher knows the answer to that, but I'm, I haven't really even seen a royalty statement since, you know, for the books that have come out. So I'm not, I'm not sure of the answer to that question. I don't know. That's a good question. You know, I would almost think that people would be buying more, you know, less Kindle because I think we're all so tired of being on screens all the time. I know I am. I actually used to read a lot more on my iPad before the pandemic and now I'm just really hungering for those like real paper books to hold in my hands because I'm always staring at my screen and I'm doing more zooms than I used to be doing Um, but I don't know the answer to that question I'd be interested to know that too that's a great point Um, having screen burnout that's I I hadn't really thought of that but you're absolutely right you're absolutely right Um, Jillian what can you tell us about what you're working on now well, it's pretty early on, um, so I'm not going to tell you very much, but it's uh, another feminist um, reimagining of a classic. And yeah. hopefully I'll be able to talk about it more soon. I, I can't wait to see what you come up with. Um, right now, Beautiful Little Fools is available everywhere. Now, when you're hearing this, we're going to put links to it in the show notes where you can grab it in Kindle edition or hardcover or, um, you know, however you choose uh or, or audiobook have you have you heard the audiobook um yet Julian? i i just heard a little clip the other day um and it was just a little bit from daisy's perspective but i'm really excited about it because they have a really good ensemble cast uh different narrators for all the characters so i haven't i haven't heard the rest yet but i'm excited for it i saw that there was going to be an ensemble cast and mm-hmm. uh, i bet that's going to be fantastic i can't wait for it to to get out in the world and, and uh, yeah me too Beautiful Little Fools available everywhere today. When you're hearing this, go grab it. Support your local bookstore. Uh, if you can't get to a bookstore, there's going to be links in the in the show notes where you can grab it from Amazon or Audible. Uh, Jillian, tell people where they can connect with you online if they want to dig into all the great stuff that you're doing. Sure. I'm I'm uh, on Instagram and Twitter at Jillian Cantor. And then my website is www.jilliancantor.com. Uh, and there's a contact form in there to email me as well. Fantastic. We're going to send everyone to see you and to pick up their copy of Beautiful Little Fools. Jillian, thank you so much for taking time to come back on the show. Thank you so much for having me again. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. They sat in silence, leaning on Spook Rock. It pulsed against his back, in rhythm with his heart. He fought an urge to press his palms to it and steal its mysteries. Kate took her hand away. 
This fundraiser for my father's campaign, was it your idea? No. I didn't think so. You need to watch out. For what? She stood and paced, hands in pockets, avoiding his eyes. Right now, you're a free agent. Nobody knows what you can do except me and Joey. That's rare. You've got space to find your own path without everybody watching you or controlling you. How many of them, us, are there? A few handfuls of families. We used to be all over, but we're kind of dying out. The secrecy issue makes it hard for us to find each other, hard to find people to marry and the like. So we congregate in a few obvious places. Salem, Sleepy Hollow. Transylvania? Don't be stupid. There's no monsters, just people. And ghosts. Ghosts are people. They were. She held her arms out. That's all there is. People in the spirit world. And places in between. Magic places. Haunted places. Like this. We gravitate to towns where we can stick together. It sounds nice. It can be smothering. We have factions. Not all of us want to get by in peace. Some of us, my father is one, say we need to be more aggressive. Increase our numbers. Take charge of things. Politics, finance, fix the world. People listen. They think they're special. They don't call themselves the gifted. They call themselves the appointed. As if God singled them out to rule. My dad's a good man. He just thinks he knows what's best for everybody. And you'll be meeting his crowd. At the fundraiser. It will be mixed. Mostly normals. But I'll point out the dangerous ones. My father employs a man named Mather. You can't miss him. He has purple eyes. Mather is like this rock. He'll be able to sense you. If you want to stay a free agent, you'll need to avoid him. Or else what? They'll want to recruit me? You're Ichabod's descendant. Ichabod was attacked and survived, a potential founder. They're already watching you. I'm no good to anyone. You don't believe that. Neither do I. She knelt and pushed the hair out of his eyes. What am I going to do with you, Jason Crane? Love me, he thought. He felt himself lean forward. They would kiss here in this sacred place, beneath the stars. Stars? Stars? What time is it? Jason jumped to his feet. We need to go. Why? A firefly swept the air, flared yellow-green, and died. What's wrong? She followed his gaze and gasped. Fireflies swam in every dark crevasse. Faces coalesced where the lights hovered. Faces of crones and young boys and stern men. Emaciated, hale, wounded, vacant, menacing, piteous. Bodies took form. Military uniforms. Bonnets, black lace, crepe, shrouds, winding sheets. Sleepy Hollow Cemetery had disgorged its dead, and that grand army of spirits now made camp at Spook Rock to await orders from their leader. A laugh chopped the wood of the forest. Jason had heard that laugh before. He squeezed Kate's hand. Run! Run!